You're watching Bloomberg Markets. I'm David Inglis here in Hong Kong. Uh, I'm Rashad Salamat. And uh, we're back to Singapore, the Milken Summit. Busy woman, Juliet Sally, today, <laughs> Jules. <laughs> We've done a quick switch out, Rish and Dave. I'm here now with the CEO of the Malaysian infrastructure conglomerate, YTL, Francis Yo. YTL comprises of five listed entities, and uh, they run assets about $16.3 billion. Francis, thanks so much for joining Brilliant. us on Bloomberg exactly Television. Uh, we wanted to ask you, essentially, where you are seeing China, I guess, transform Southeast Asia. I know you had a panel on that earlier today. So is this China's growth really transforming what you are seeing? across the region? Definitely. China with all the uh, infrastructure projects, the fast trains, and then uh, layering on top of that Alibaba's uh, digital infrastructure, they are showing Asia and the world what, what could be done if physical infrastructure backs up the digital infrastructure. And Alibaba could do, what, 25 billion US in a single day on singles day. Yeah. Who can do that in the world? So the most opportunity amongst your five businesses? I think uh, Southeast Asia and Asia must learn to build infrastructure like the Chinese does and uh, build it well and build it inexpensively, price of parity, build it at the cost that the people could afford to use those facilities. If they can get that right and then layer on top of that the digital infrastructure that is now pervasive in Asia, that, that will be formidable for Asia's future growth. Of course, you're based in Malaysia, and we have seen Malaysia's Prime Minister Mahathir push back quite sternly against a lot of unfair deals, including some Chinese state companies. So do you see this deterring investors from China, which does really make up the bulk of foreign divest- direct investment? No, I, I don't think that he's deterring foreign investment. Mahathir is known as a very simple, op- Malaysia is open for business, very pro-business, has always been. And what he's saying is that we want much more transparent deals that are you know, subjected to the global standards. And I think that's fair. So it's fair in terms of a lot of their uh, policies as well and tightening, reigning in debt. You think that's a good move? I don't understand the politics behind it, but whatever Mahathir is saying right now is pretty fair, that we want to subject it to all international scrutiny standards and, and Malaysia open for business, which is a good, good call. And no impact to investment that you're seeing so far? Well, I think investments because of the Chinese-U.S. Uh, trade war, that necessarily made people uh, rethink about investments. There's a kind of slowdown in the velocity of money. But uh, Malaysia and Vietnam people, countries like that, tend to gain a bit more when there's such a, a little trade war between U.S. and China. You can see China in Guangdong is already introducing a lot of incentives to make people not go away from China as a result of the trade war. So because people will flow to Malaysia and Vietnam and to hatch themselves, yeah. Speaking of flowing, we did have, of course, the uh, deferral of the signing between the high-speed rail network of, between Kuala Lumpur and Singapore. Do you expect to make another bid for that in, in due course? Uh, definitely, because I think, again, on, on the pretext that you will call an international tender and price it correctly, I think when all the dust has settled down when, and postponing to 2020 is a good decision so for both governments to rethink and re, re, uh, readjust the cost and everything, and when they get their act together, I'm quite sure they will, uh, they will see the issue as it is. And I'm quite sure both will be positive. I'm quite sure the private sector can play a much bigger role than and, and that presently and this stage. Probably they could even come up with their own financing. So that would be pretty good by 2020. By 2020, I was going to say, do you have yeah. a time frame? Yeah. 2020, okay. Yeah, they'll make a decision on that, yes. Um, we've heard you're bidding for a stake in the Swiss multinational Lagrange Holsum, their Indonesian unit, around $2 billion. Can you confirm that? Well, I cannot confirm. <laughs> <laughs> I cannot deny, neither do I confirm. <laughs> no comment. No comment, okay. <laughs> uh, we want to also ask you, I guess, where you are seeing other uh, investment opportunities or perhaps m and opportunities amongst the region. Uh, yeah, because of this trade war, there's now a little bit uh, a reluctance of many big players to reinvest in the Asian or emerging nation uh, territory or even in Europe. So this this gives us uh, opportunities. We've got about 12 billion US worth of uh, M&A capabilities right now. So yeah, I'm beginning to see better opportunities presented. And in fact, in the last uh, couple of months, I've closed one or two and I've got quite a lot on the table, which I've not seen before, which is good. 
thought leaders here at the Milken Summit. What are you mainly focusing on when you sort of talk behind closed doors? Well, actually, I always advocate the TCRF, Transparent Korean uh, uh, regulatory, regulatory Framework, for infrastructure and all important utility projects to be bid by the world and financed by the world, rather than being restricted to their own whatever uh, skewed towards their own political alignment. If infrastructure projects can be done, like what the British does, I mean the British allows people like uh, Malaysians to own their water assets, or the French to own their power companies, why can't the world learn from that? And, and the regulatory framework is very transparent, it's very coherent, they don't change their mind every five years. And because investments of such nature, utilities and infrastructure are so long term, you cannot have a flip flop in a government and a political uh, change of mind every five years. So that's why, if it is well understood by the leaders of today, and I think they will understand that they have to build this fiscal infrastructure so that the digital infrastructure can take advantage of it, and then the world will be a better place, certainly. Finally, you mentioned, well, we mentioned that you um, manage assets about $16.3 billion. Do you have a forecast to get to a next level by, say, 2020, 2025? No, we like to grow. We always we want to grow steadily. But we are very long-term players. We look for a long-term infrastructure project by nature, long-term. Even the hotel projects, if you buy hotels, very long-term. But we have got a formidable management team that can manage long-term assets. What I love is the quarterly dividends yeah. that I give to my shareholders. And I myself, a very big shareholder, my family. <laughs> so I love the dividend long term. I don't like to subject our company to the tyranny of quarterization. I don't quite like that. So I love to choose businesses that are very long term in nature, but very profitable. Yeah, it's always good to pay yourself some profits. Francis, thanks so much. Thank you, Enjoy Jim. your time you. at the Vilken Summit. Dave Rich, that is the YTL CEO, Francis Yo, with me on the sidelines of the 2018 Asia Summit, hosted, of course, by the Milken Institute. Thank you.